welcome to the prospective new PhD students. Um, we're very happy to have you here. Um, and we're happy to have everyone here at the annual Walt Fisher Lecture. Um, this lecture, if for those of you who don't know, began around 10 years ago, I think, right about the time when Walt retired. Um, and it is, we, we established this annual lecture as a way to sort of commemorate and honor um, the, Walt's extensive work and rhetoric, and in particular his um, human communication as narrative, which is his most fam famous and widely influential book, but also just the way in which he shaped and continues to shape this department and this school. Um, so first, before we get any further, I'd like all of us to publicly acknowledge Walt Fisher, Professor. <laughs> Her work has been in health communication has been widely supported 
um, and um, she's been doing work in this area for some time, but I'm going to now turn it over to Tom Hollihan to say a few words about Elisa. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. You didn't mention whether those Kentucky cousins were married to each other. <laughs> well, that's what some of them are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but thanks for bringing it up at the Walters Right. A little low hanging Appalachian <laughs> 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 For, for allowing me to say just a couple of things. First, it's a great treat to see Walt again. Uh, Patty and I have been at USC for a long time, and Walt Fisher was instrumental in hiring us in 1980 to USC. And I have to say, Walt is living proof that, that your teaching, your mentoring, your, your role as an instructor doesn't stop just because it's to a faculty colleague. He was clearly the most significant mentor that I've had. He's, he remains a dear friend, and it's really a pleasure that Walt is able to be with us again and to uh, participate in this lecture. So it's a real honor for us to, to be with Walt. And it's a great honor for me to be with Alicia. As, as, uh, as was mentioned in the brief introduction by Sarah, you know, people come in with a notion of what they want to do, and sometimes it, it turns out they do something very different. And Alicia came with a strong interest in critical studies and in rhetoric and in politics. And now she's getting big grants and doing health research. So it only shows the kind of pernicious impact that having people like Sheila, <laughs> and Wayne Miller, and Michael Cody, you know, talk about metastasizing cancers in the American Studies program. Well, we've got many of those too. <laughs> no, this is a really exciting doctoral program. And the greatest evidence of its excitement is that people do grow and change and learn while they're here and they take that skill set out into the world and they do really important work. This is work that is gonna make people's lives better, is actually gonna save lives, so it's a pleasure for us to honor it. And as you note, she's on a fast career path. I wouldn't have advised her to become a department chair when she was still an associate professor, <laughs> but I actually did that myself, <laughs> and so did Patty. So, you know, I guess, you, just, you learn what you see. So uh, we welcome Alicia back with great enthusiasm. I'm sure that she will give not just a provocative, but also an entertaining lecture. And uh, I'm proud of her achievements and proud to be able to share her good work with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I just realized I came to uh, the University of Southern California in 1999. So when Sarah was just hired and when Walt had just transitioned, and um, so I suppose it's full circle. I'm very honored to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I was a student of Walt's, and I think um, I was told today that I'm one of the first people to come back to give this talk who are part of the Merge PhD program. And I think that my, I'll call it intellectual promiscuity, <laughs> interest um, in different ideas was really, you know, was was really fertilized at USC. I'm so, <laughs> I'm so grateful for uh, that. I, I'm just grateful um, to for that opportunity, and I I do um, I do think that my work continues to bloom and grow, um, but um, but certainly is deeply rooted in the influence um, in the instruction that I received here. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, my own work um, doing health communication intervention development. I'm going to talk a little bit about my theoretical orientation and then what I've learned over the past few years in terms of um, lessons, kind of how my thoughts about intervention development has grown from its roots and theories and instruction at USC really. Um, I do need to acknowledge some funders associated with this research. My first uh, internal research grant actually was uh, funded by, at USC. Um, Francesca Gardini and I um, had one of the first Norman Lear um, internal grants here. And so um, I hope to do her honor here and people in my cohort um, who also would have been extremely ecstatic to, to be here too um, today. You all might have seen something like this circulating in social media. Uh, this one map sums it up, the damage caused by the anti-vaccination movement. Um, and while this image um, was powerful in terms of showing the impact and the spread 
of, um, immun uh, of uh, diseases that are preventable with immunizations. This map only tells one side of the story. Um, the Council on Foreign Relations actually wasn't simply blaming the anti-vaccination um, movement when they created um, this map. Actually, they were concerned about two audiences, um, two unvaccinated audiences. So when we think about how to design interventions to improve demand for immunizations, which is the focus of some of my research, we might think about an under-vaccinated community first. These are kids who haven't received all of their shots. They certain, they, as an audience, they share certain characteristics. They have lower household income. Their mothers are less likely to go to college. They lack easy access to vaccines. In my area of the country, in Appalachia, Kentucky, they're more rural um, and they're largely white. But that audience looks different in, down, in urban Los Angeles, of course. This audience is very different from children without vaccinations. Um, these are um, kids whose health gets a free ride from being relatively privileged. They um, get advantaged if they um, are around a larger herd immunity protection. These kids reside in households with greater uh, median household incomes. Their mothers tend to be married and college educated, making informed decisions in the best interest of their kids. They have easy access to vaccines, but they choose not to use them. When we think about this under-vaccinated population first, it's a health equity problem. It's a problem of diffusion of immunizations, of, uh, of innovations. If we think about immunizations as an innovation, from Roger's diffusion of innovation theory, it is a communication problem in how to spread this new innovation throughout society and the population. And when there's inadequate um, immunization, inadequate diffusion, you see disease spread. In contrast, when you have children without vaccinations, but they're surrounded by a herd, they're protected. So children without vaccinations are what I would call a public policy problem. In fact, a recent uh, uh, article in the journal Pediatrics said that the largest numbers of unvaccinated children um, lived in counties in California, Illinois, New York, Washington, Pennsylvania, Texas, Oklahoma, states that allowed philosophical exemptions to laws mandated vaccinations for children as they entered school had significantly higher estimated rates of unvaccinated children. Okay. That's a serious public policy problem, but communication alone is probably not going to move the needle in this group. Communication can make a big difference for health equity reasons in our other populations. So the focus of my talk is on how do you design interventions for medically underserved communities. Those are um, the kids that I'm focusing on in my talk. Theoretically, when I think about this as a communication problem, I'm interested in it because when we change the way we communicate, we change society. My interest in communication and social change originated um, from my work at the University of Southern California. And when I was um, early on in my doctoral program, I worked with the Metamorphosis Project. For those of you familiar with the project, you might be familiar with this uh, graph in terms of thinking about uh, communication infrastructure theory. Um, at the time, we were thinking about how do structures work to support and facilitate strong communities? Um, how does a community turn to share resources when a crisis occurs, like September 11th? And um, we theorized that there's a storytelling network between residents, organizations, media. This type of storytelling network can be turned to political problems or solutions. It also can be potentially turned to health problems and solutions. But for my interest, I was interested in what I saw a rhetorical problem. That is, if we think about this storytelling network, you know, what story qualities matter? What makes them memorable, actionable, repeatable? How do, why does something go viral? Does who tells the stories themselves matter? Is there a symmetry within this network that matters? And can we turn this network through the power of stories to improving health outcomes? And that's fundamentally, theoretically, what I became very interested in. My own work, when I've thought about the problem of immunizations, I'm also interested in this multi-step diffusion of innovations. Everett Rogers talks about five characteristics of an innovation. 
um, that, that helps explain um, its rate of diffusion in society. So whether it's relatively, relatively advantageous compared to previous innovations, whether it's compatible with an audience's values, how complex, um, how simple it is, whether it's easy to try, whether we can observe this innovation. When thinking about it and thinking about um, an innovation like immunization, particularly a new immunization such as the HPV vaccine, in my own work, I saw this, the lack of spread, this lack of uh, diffusion in a population as a um, health equity issue. And I thought about how these types of characteristics about innovation and that they're, the way that, um, that they may be active ingredients in how an innovation spread as important um, to the process of storytelling about an innovation in a way that facilitates through this flow from media, from actors, um, so people learn about the innovation in the community. So when, we, when I think about and theorize why communication flow matters for applied research to address health disparities in my work, I'm interested in points of divergence between scientific and lay epistemologies or ways of knowing um, related to prevention service guidelines, who should be immunized when, who should be screened for cancer when, also, the ways that what we call knowledge, attitude, and practice gaps might exacerbate um, the burden of disparities on certain poor communities. And then, finally, how sometimes inadequate or even no clinical communication might also exacerbate um, barriers um, or access barriers. I'm also very interested in finding winnable battles. That is, I think that immunization is an important one for communication researchers to focus in on because the research shows that even when you move the, remove the barrier of cost, right, you offer free vaccines to individuals, there are still barriers to uptake. And also, immunization is a case where more tailored communication isn't very necessary. There's not a lot of variation in how immunization works. So targeted messages often matter and can make a difference in this population. So today I'm going to talk to you about four interventions um, that I've developed, some more briefly than others. I'm going to start with, um, this is sort of my journey over the past um, four years or so, or even longer actually, in looking at some of these issues. The first intervention I developed was called 123-PAP, um, Easy Steps to Prevent Cervical Cancer Prevention. And I started looking at this issue because we have a new um, innovation, HPV vaccination, and we have a disparity between rates of uptake in this vaccine and the receipt of all three doses, so adhering to the vaccine schedule in Kentucky compared to the U.S. population, and particularly when we look at this U.S. adult female um, population. So even when people can make the decisions themselves, they're not dependent on, the, on their parents, we don't see very high rates of uptake. Remember, we need high rates of uptake to develop herd immunity. And my colleagues in public health at um, the University of Kentucky started joking that HPV vaccine is the vaccine we couldn't even give away because they went to a rural clinic and offered um, do dose one for free and then coupons, so essentially taking away the burden of cost for this new innovation for dose two and three, and they found 45% uptake in dose one, and less than 5% of people offered the vaccine for three got, received all three doses of the vaccine, even when there's standard follow-up phone calls, reminders, et cetera, in place from a clinic. That's a problem, and it's a communication problem that potentially we can solve. So in doing my own formative research in the community and working with um, a team of researchers as part of the Rural Cancer Prevention Center, um, at the University of Kentucky, we observed weak provider recommendations. Providers weren't giving people what we call um, presumptive, um, making presumptive arguments or pr making presumptive recommendations to their parents, um, saying that, you know, with respect to clinical communication around HPV, they were reticent about this new, um, this new immunization. We also looked and found knowledge, attitude, practice gaps and differences between adopters and non-adopters of the vaccine. 
when we talked to people um, who had received the vaccine, we found that many people were not knowledgeable of what, th what they just received, right? So knowledge was not a good predictor of the behavior. Um, why? Because many people performed the behavior they got what their doctor told them without really understanding it. Um, and so it really became clear to us that knowledge-based strategies, simply pushing more information at the clinic level might not be the best strategy um, and there might be room for improving clinic-based communication. So in our own research, we worked on a DVD that could be shown to people um, while they're waiting um, after getting the first dose of the vaccine. And we conducted some focus groups with women from Eastern Kentucky and um, we're trying to figure out what are some appropriate messages to, um, to talking to adult women. We used credible advocates, young women from the community, nurses that people identified as credible and um, compelling, a local physician and another um, health advocate. And when we were thinking about this in terms of um, message development, um, one kind of practical application of diffusion theory that we thought of from a communication perspective is that we could use these um, ideas about diffusion to get at this issue of adherence. In other words, it would be important to develop messages around the relative advantage of the vaccine, the complexity issue, not knowing the benefits of all three doses, getting at this issue of whether or not people had to start all the way over um, if they missed a dose rather than just catching up where they left off. We also found very promising message development areas, a positive value in the community and staying on top of their reproductive health. Um, this survivor saying, um, and, and a young uh, granddaughter of a um, cervical cancer victim saying, you know, this is an opportunity for her generation. Um, we also found 18-year-olds um, were willing to say things, you know, now that this is my decision, I've got to look at for myself. So it's different um, from this younger population. And when we looked at this video, um, we found some good data that it was believable, it kept people's attention, um, and its perceived message effectiveness is high. We rolled it out in a randomized control trial, and nearly half of the women, 43.3% 40, who were randomized to the DVD intervention in a community trial, completed the three-dose HPV vaccine series compared to 31.9% in a boosted control. And what I mean by boosted control is that we had community nurses doing everything possible to bring everyone back in to um, receive their three doses of the vaccine. And so what we saw is that at that people in the intervention condition receiving this kind of communication boost were 2.44 times more likely to return to the vaccine than people in the control condition, even beyond their initial um, intention to complete the vaccine series. So what did we learn for this? Well, we learned that in Kentucky, we were able to, I don't know if I can, yeah, we were able to get a vaccine rate for our medically underserved population in a poor region, of Eastern Kentucky up to rates that look like a relatively privileged uh, med managed care population in California. Um, and this compares to what was a three dose rate of 4.5% before. In other words, by following the, uh, an enhanced standard of care and by developing a communication intervention, we can eliminate virtually a health disparity gap in access. So this understanding is translatable as a design process for other um, opportunities. So my most recent research takes the same approach to our Protect Their Future intervention. This was funded by Merck. Um, we wanted to develop a, a video appropriate to an adolescent parent audience about the importance of adolescent immunization very broadly. So flu, meningitis, and HPV vaccination, along with the ones that were compulsory for school, school attendance. We wanted to design messages with high impact, personally relevant, compatible with values, promoting this relative advantage, observable and memorable. So we conducted formative research in the same way, and we came up with a story and, and video that looked like this, and I'll show you it here. The flu vaccine is safe and approved for kids as young as six months old. We live in such small communities. You know, everyone is together, church, schools. My son comes home with the flu. 
Well, you know, next thing you know, my wife has the flu. Then uh, I'm sitting there having to miss work, trying to treat the two that has the flu. It doesn't take long for it to channel all the way around the whole community. You can eliminate a lot of the illness by just taking the vaccination. I think if parents knew how many children died every year from influenza, uh, they might think twice about not getting it. Think about it. We tell teenagers to use safety belts in cars, helmets when they ride bikes and ATVs, and padding when they play sports. Flu and HPV and other vaccines are another great way to protect our children. Why wouldn't we take advantage of those? When I play football, I have to put on all the gear such as helmets, padding, pants, a cup, and cleats. Yeah, getting vaccinated is just like putting on all the football gear. As they're coming into their teenage years, we're not gonna always be there with them. Parents are given the responsibility of caring for their children. And as such, they need to make good decisions for their children while they have them in their care and custody. And I think that it is imperative that parents do vaccinate their children as one of those good decisions. Imagine losing your child to, you know, to a disease or an illness. You know, I mean, that, that has to be devastating on a parent. I feel like, you know, I don't want to look back in the past and think maybe I could have done something. And, and that's one reason I choose to vaccinate my child. So when we see this as a translatable design strategy, we see personally relevant people in the message, right? People drawn from our local community, which is uh, predominantly 99.9% .9 you know, white, um, rural population in Eastern Kentucky. Um, we have um, rhetoric that is compatible with the audience's values. In a poor region in Eastern Kentucky, a lot of children are cared for by the state, by relatives, in this community, there's a lot of intervention, government intervention, frankly, in, um, in people's everyday lives. And so this idea of a responsible adult taking care of their children while they're in their care and custody was um, language that was used in that way. Promoted the relative advantage of taking care of this now. You don't want to look back. It was a simple message about protecting their future. It was observable um, using prescriptive models in the message. And all of you probably remember the young boy that was in the ad. <laughs> so our preliminary findings, this is very preliminary. I've been under a foot of snow in the past uh, week. And so I haven't met with my, I have a meeting with my statistician next week. But we have 361 um, parent surveys. We're currently in the field. Um, people are watching the DVD, parents are watching the DVD and then randomized to intervention or control condition um, by region and we've been uh, by, uh, in the area. And pre and post test, we're seeing some good data on intention that they are more likely to intend to have their adolescents immunized for influenza, um, intend to get all three shots for male adolescents and intend to get all three shots for female and adolescents. So lining up in the same direction as our other study. So these are video-based products, and certainly they can be shown in clinics or even in a school-based setting. But what about social media? And what about targeting a younger audience of adolescents? This is all, approach is also translatable to a social media or web-based um, targeted education approach. So here, I'm using a similar approach, targeting an audience with an HPV social um, network intervention. Um, to impact um, change, it requires really meeting different audience demands. So different than parents or young adult women, my other two intervention tar audience targets, this um, video is targeting adolescents themselves. Specifically, we know that um, adolescents are more likely to be sensation seekers, they're novelty seeking, the social network metaphor we've learned is powerful to understand disease networks and certainly translatable in an adolescent context. And we decided in this case to adopt the tone of a social media startup. I don't have any um, data to show you on this because I'm just starting this project right now, but you can get the sense from the intervention pattern as before. This is a website that I've um, created at gethpv.com. It's live if you'd like to go see it. And um, this is our um, intervention video that's associated. You're familiar with the world's most popular social networks, but we'd like to introduce you to another less celebrated social network that currently has more than 79 million active members and is gaining nearly 14 million every year. What's unique about it is you have to know someone who's already a member to get an invitation. And most people who belong to this social network remain anonymous. 
But just like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat, this social network is all about sharing. But not the type of sharing you're used to. No, this social network is completely different. It's all about sharing viruses. Viruses that could mean painful procedures to try and deal with the damage caused to your body. Viruses that are super embarrassing, like watching a romantic movie scene with your parents. It's called the HPV network. It stands for human papil... papilloma... Pa human papilloma virus. And it's as cool as it sounds. Both guys and gals can participate in the HPV network. And you can become a part of the HPV network without knowing it. But if you do become a member of the network, you might receive some notifications like genital warts, Hello. or penile cancer, or head or neck cancer, or cervical cancer, or throat cancer, or gorilla mumps. Okay, we made that last one up, but for real, you can get cancer. That's no joke. It can cause cancers that require a lot of treatment and could even lead to death if ignored. But every social network has its downfalls. Most people think, I can always opt out. Can I opt out? No. And here's another fun fact. Among Americans ages 15 to 49, three out of four are part of the network. We're everywhere. <laughs> the genital HPV network may not produce symptoms or illness. It's sneaky, like a ninja. So a person who is a member may never know about it. So how does the genital HPV network gain new members? Two words. Sexual contact. And it doesn't even have to be going all the way for it to make you a new member. It can spread skin to skin. So you can spread it through actions like oral sex or even just touching another person's private parts. Like I mentioned, once you're in, you're in to the HPV network. And you can never, ever get out. Never. Never, ever, ever. It's a virus that lives in your body and there's no medicine to treat it. For some people, an HPV infection will clear up on its own and not cause much damage. But for others, it can lead to serious health problems. There's no way to know how the virus will act in your body. It's unpredictable, like your mom on Facebook. So what do you say? Is this a social network you want to join? You think your HPV material? Do you want genital warts? I'm back! Then... Okay, trust me. Nobody wants to be in the HPV network. Luckily, HPV, the virus that causes cervical, head, neck, and penile cancers, is preventable. Yet millions are unaware. Don't let yourself or someone you love stay at risk for HPV-related diseases. You can be protected against HPV, so spread the word. Talk to your parents and talk to your doctor about getting the HPV vaccine. A simple vaccine that protects you against the kinds of HPV that cause <sighs> genital warts and certain types of cancers. Just like you receive shots as a baby to protect you from preventable diseases, this shot protects you from HPV. Don't think vaccines work? Just ask the polio virus. Remember, talk to your parents and your doctor about the HPV vaccine. Go to gethpv.com to find out why you definitely don't want to become a part of this social network and learn how you can protect yourself. So as we think about translating messages um, and going to where an audience is, increasingly obviously social media um, will be um, important. And so um, one of the projects that I've um, worked on not too long ago was um, really the first application um, that I'm aware of um, that was used to um, increase awareness about HP vaccination and um, increase um, demand for HP vaccination and also pap testing at the time. And at the time, we, um, this was a uh, Cause the Movement um, campaign. It was designed to be a tailored campaign um, that would use users' content on Facebook and integrate it with a social media application that we developed um, to educate people about um, HPV and cervical cancer prevention. We used a mix of earned, own, and purchased media, and it was a success in terms of the reach um, and um, perceived awareness um, of the campaign in the state. We used messages that were once again compatible with um, an audience's prior va values. One of the things we kept um, hearing, um, and once again, I started doing this research about 
in the early days when the HPV vaccine just um, was developed, was that if this was a vaccine for breast cancer, everyone would be talking about it. And so we use this um, in our um, messages, um, and both in PSAs and as well as application development. So here's an example. What if a vaccine existed for breast cancer? That's the kind of life-changing news that would start a movement that would spread through your whole social network. Well, HPV, the virus that causes cervical cancer, is preventable, yet millions are unaware. Don't let someone you love stay at risk for cervical cancer. Spread the word and cause the movement for a cervical cancer-free Kentucky. Visit causethemovement.org to find out how. And the application, um, when people launched it by going to um, causethemovement.org, launched an, an educational um, kind of script that talked about Kentucky's cervical cancer rate and used faces drawn from people's Facebook profile, of course, depending on their settings, but at the time, um, and kind of talked about the hundreds of women um, who um, could develop cervical cancer in Kentucky each year. Um, many of the women die, um, had the message um, related to breast cancer, and talks about um, the importance of um, diffusing this information broadly to um, the population. Um, it would pull in their best friends or closest friends into their profile um, and um, concluded by serving pictures of people, their loved ones, et cetera, up to them in the application. Um, along with a call to action um, at the conclusion of this. So when I think about these four projects um, all together and I think about how, what are some of the principles in designing communication for impact and how can we move from theorizing and developing interventions that often stay on the shelves and get them disseminated more broadly into the public. Um, I, I've thought of you know, some things that, that might be useful for other people to know <laughs> and also that um, have really started to influence my thinking. First, um, all of my research is community-based. I really think that we need to understand lay ways of talking about health, disease, illness, particularly when they diverge from scientific ways of knowing, something that Walt Fisher taught me a long time ago. Um, and um, also, more information is not always better. We tend to want to give people more and more information, but um, if we think about not evidence-based practice, but practice-based evidence, what in practice, how can we develop an evidence base for some of the message work that we do, ground up, can help us build theories of what I would call low information health decision making and behavior change. Much like theories of low information voter rationality has been developed in political science that Tom Hollihan taught me a little bit about when I was at USC. And so I've really been thinking about this, about the impact of emotional flow um, in um, message development and how that works. I also know that often behavior and audience specific message quality and enhancing approaches are important to motivation. That is, if I can figure out in my audience what might be personally relevant to them, um, that is important and is critical to improving attention to the advertisement, attention to the message, etc. And there are different strategies that are needed to promote adoption of a behavior compared to adherence. And we have in our health communication literature, a lot of knowledge about what we can do to promote adoption of a new behavior. We know very little about motivating people to adhere to a behavior when they have a past behavioral experience that might not be pleasant, like getting a shot in the arm, right? Um, and I increasingly think about Roger's five factors in ways that we might think about principles of uh, message design as they relate to innovations as well. Finally, we always need to match messages, um, audiences, and channels. And this sounds really intuitive, but, but we're really good at this in communication. And this is something that we bring to the table when we work with people in public health. We know why um, developing a colorectal cancer um, campaign for 65 plus year olds is probably not something that we're going to be doing with social media on Facebook, given um, the audience, the channel message. But other people might think, well, it's a new media. You should be using it. And so it's our job as communication researchers to think about the principles um, in play and how we might design for impact. I've also been thinking a lot about dissemination um, in my research. And in all of my, um, all of my uh, messages that I'm developing, I'm, I'm getting better at this over time, I think, in my career. 
I'm starting to design for other potential audiences. So thinking about um, how do you take something like 123PAP and move it into a national audience? Well, um, since I'm funded by the CDC, that gives a natural platform for connecting with others. But there are other types of networks that we need to reach out to. For example, in public health, there are practice-based research networks. At UK, there's a national coordinating center. And these are groups that want to test out innovations in clinical settings and different health clinics. Um, in Kentucky, there are natural alliances with our health departments um, that are still providing clinical services that can be um, good partners. And thinking about what they might need in order to branch out statewide is something that I've been thinking a lot about. I've also been thinking a lot about po possible message adaptations before I even design an intervention. So for example, I knew when I developed 123PAP that West Virginia's Appalachian population looked mighty similar to my Eastern Kentucky um, population. And so by partnering with the West Virginia Immunization Network, I was able to create a similar video and disseminate it in West Virginia without going through a lot of different, um, ex what can be very expensive message testing. We also need to identify possible mess message adaptations for similar audiences. So I started in Eastern Kentucky, but I actually did a lot of research in Kentucky in general. So a statewide message adaptation um, was also um, possible. And so thinking about what components of our message design and stories are variable, right? And which ones should be constant across our message design, something I've been thinking a lot about as well. Um, also, we can, as we develop interventions, think about possible message adaptations for dissimilar audiences. So in my 123PAP intervention, um, there was a story by Tommy, and she says, getting the HP vaccine is an opportunity our mothers and grandmothers never had to protect themselves. And she talks about how her grandmother passed away in 1977. This is a powerful st uh, story from a young woman from Appalachia, Kentucky. However, in designing for dissemination, our partners in North Carolina for 123PAP North Carolina um, thought about an African-American population, and they actually used a survivor um, talking about, um, about what this means in her life and with, and with her daughters, et cetera. In other words, the story can change appropriate to the population in need, and so being open to that is important in creating uh, a dissemination strategy. Channel variability is also something I've been thinking a lot of like. We initially showed 123PAP in a clinic setting after the first dose of the vaccine. Uh, we now have a dissemination and implementation um, research study where we were evaluating um, what this, look, this type of intervention looked like when posted to a website, rotated in a loop in a clinic setting. The message needed to be changed. It wasn't just about adherence. It had to also be about uptake. It also um, would be different to be run in a women's clinic versus a broader general clinic. So thinking about these types of um, other channels is something that um, is critical to message design um, for dissemination. So um, thank you so much for <laughs> listening to my talk tonight. It's 9.50, I think, so we're to 45, so I think I did pretty good. So <laughs> do you have questions? <laughs> <laughs>
sort of volunteer volunteer for debate, but you know, a, a sort of debate about this on the schoolyard mm -hmm. about why I would have my 11 year old mm -hmm. be vaccinated for a, 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 you know something that was clearly about an STD. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if that moral discourse mm -hmm. about promiscuity, promiscuous, promiscuity mm -hmm. and and girls' sexual activity, young girls' sexual activity, comes seeps into the under vaccinated, the, the, mm -hmm. you know, the access, because the video that you mm -hmm. created, which I thought was really brilliant, is, is, is targeted to teenagers, not to their parents, mm -hmm. right? And it's the parents who are, are the ones who are kind of reproducing this moral religious discourse mm -hmm. about sexual activity. So um, two, or a few different things. Um, so, Yes, and so that's one of the reasons why our first video was targeted to, so the first time we developed an intervention that was targeted to adults sidestepping this on some levels. The second um, intervention, um, the Protect Their Future intervention does, I didn't show you a clip of it, but does take this on a little bit with parents and um, talks about um, and, and uses the provider to talk about how this isn't giving your kid permission to do anything, it's about protecting their future. and. Um, and, and uses that, that language that the provider used and that was acceptable. Uh, acceptable. Um, the other piece of it is that um, uh, the, I would say the, the uh, tone has, the broader campaign that we did in Kentucky about, um, about with Cause the Movement, I think helped shift attitudes um, on this. Um, so laid a foundation for other work. So when, what I mean by that is that um, as more people learned more about that, the true religious conservative se segment, audience segment, I, actually I think is a very small. And in fact, national surveys show it's like 10% or something as being like the moral reason. And I think of that as um, ideological and not, mu not really movable potentially with a one-shot video um, or any one-shot anything. Um, and so it is a different type of persuasion that's occurred. Um, and so I'm going after not the tail, but you know, but the middle here with the interventions because I think there's a lot more room to move. So, so I guess to answer your question, uh, yes, it's different for the adolescents than adults. Yes, I think that's important as part of the conversation with um, in the provider messages. But also, um, that was sort of the reason for bundling HPV with other adolescent immunizations as part of the message strategies to targeting. Um, to targeting parents because when parents do not have a, as one of my um, colleagues says, when, they, when there's not a special chair for HPV vaccine, when it's just brought, when it's part of the rest of um, you know, <laughs> you know, it's not when it's part of the the rest of the vaccine package, um, and um, you know, in no other context, you know, we don't parents don't. Um, you know, we, we want the best math classes. We don't want them in the easy, you know, we want, and every, just, just because it's, we have language in the video, just because it's not, um, not required doesn't mean it's recommended. And in this community, it's not like, um, they, they, there's a lot of pride on, um, around this kind of liberty of making the decision as well. So we tap into some of that value in the, um, in the intervention. few empirical studies that actually showed a large sample that actually vaccination does not increase sexual promiscuity. And we've been kind of waiting for that sort of clinical data um, to show up. There was, yeah, we had there was, there was good data, uh, there was decent kind of survey data that Noel Brewer had been showing a few years ago too, but I mean, I don't know if data can help with that, some of this ideology. I'd like to believe it, but <laughs> it's, not having data is a problem, but yeah. But, um, but yeah, yeah. You mentioned that mm -hmm. even when it was free, you couldn't get people to do it, but the vaccine is in fact quite expensive if you have to pay cash for mm -hmm. it. And there were a lot of insurance companies that were not including it. Mm -hmm. And so cost, I think, was a barrier for some time. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm wondering if, it, if it's some iteration we don't need to address the policy community with mm -hmm. some of these claims. You know, those, those are elite audiences we have to communicate with as well about 
Mm -hmm. And so um, I sit on a, um, an HPV advisory panel for um, Merck now since I, since I have received funding from Merck. And it's very interesting to kind of debate about there's an, um, th now there's HPV 9 or Gardasil 9 um, that's, um, that's um, moving out. And um, the um, uh, interesting, um, I guess, uh, the interesting piece about this is exactly that, is the policy around the staging. Of um, of when insurance companies are going to opt into this the new the new vaccine, and it's um, and it's a very the data is very good on the vaccine. It um, it will stop pre-invasive cancers. You know, there's it, it's new and better um, on the public health level. Um, but how so that's a real issue in terms of how that's communicated, who signs up. So that does create um, serious barriers. But once again, when those when we have this disparity in access that goes along with it and it breaks down by socioeconomic and other lines, um, you know, that, that can be pr particularly damaging to public health. So that is, I think, the role of communication um, there. Um, the other thing that's interesting about um, immunization from a policy perspective is that, you know, um, and one of the things that we did with our intervention is that we, but we were able to teach people how to work with the vaccine manufacturing um, reimbursement pro programs. And so that type of regulatory communication and, com you know, around that is, I think, a new area for people to work on because it's this combination of policy and it's also figuring out how this, I, get, I, I would call it an organization, a health related organizational um, communication problem. Mm -hmm. Speaking of organization, <laughs> there's a, a lot of data on who the messenger ought to be in interventions and mm -hmm. organizations that for different kinds of change mm -hmm. uh, activities, you don't necessarily want the CEO, you want the joint mm -hmm. supervisors, et cetera, et cetera. You use this great convention in mm -hmm. that video mm -hmm. of the reliable, mm -hmm. truthful, you know, um, mm -hmm. believable uh, mm -hmm. spokesperson. Mm -hmm. the, the smart adult in the room. Mm -hmm. How did you decide to do that? Did you do any message construction and testing mm -hmm. around him? Because he didn't seem to be a doctor or mm -hmm. Yeah, he was a high school basketball star in the region. <laughs> and he is a, a well-known person. Ever, uh, 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 yeah, and, um, and, you know, and um, also someone who was kind of, uh, do, you know, parent um, as well. Um, and um, uh, well, now it's interesting, and and that's where you have an advantage, I think, in working in smaller rural communities um, where people know each other, and you know, rem uh, people talk about you know who the nurses are that they they talk to about information, or who you know what other parents are part of it. And I, it wasn't a, a broadly extensive um, uh, study um, to to figure this out, but um, but in our formative research, we did find out. Those, those things and then when we kind of tested them out or we had people involved um, initially you know people would recognize people and would, you know and um, were likable and were believable um, and so that's who we'd go with. But you also see Smart. that sort of ironic display <laughs> when you say yeah oh yeah for that one yeah 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 <laughs> yeah for the adolescents yeah <laughs> yeah we decided that you know like I, when we, and it's interesting, so for each of those, um, for that video, um, we played around with the script, with, um, with the flow quite a bit. Um, it's just, in, it was, that is, was, is an interesting script that I just want to use without video to do some, ex with some, uh, Robin Navi and I were, t was talking about emotional flow at our last health communication conference. And um, I thought, I have the perfect script for you, who's an experimentalist, which I'm not, um, to kind of, <laughs> think about some of these um, issues with and um, so early on we were testing that out with how to kind of create a break and where he kind of comes in 
and it just was so corny and cheesy and this was so low budget by the way so so and and so i'm just like well you know if we're gonna have corny and cheese we need to go all the way and commit to it and yeah exactly so you know you know so that they you know that there's a willful uh suspension of disbelief i guess um in that context yeah uh, thanks very much <laughs> Well, just like television, we can't rely on the goodwill of Facebook to do it, I don't think. <laughs> um, you know, um, but I do have some ideas about that. Um, first of all, I think is starting in offline, real life platforms and sharing spaces using natural networks, natural social networks, where people are posting as part of interventions and stuff is one way to go, and people are looking at that. Um, second, I think that there is a there's going to be a lot of dissemination studies and uh, opportunity with healthcare reform actually. Insurance companies now have incentives to and can actually get tax discounts. Um, <laughs> and I don't know all the logistics of it, but some of my public policy and public health folks have kind of talked a little bit about this and we're starting to figure this out um, for, do, for buying into, you know, for, for, for prevention and for education. And so, um, you know, they're the ones who are going to be paying more if prevention, you know, if uptake isn't high on preventive health services. So, um, you know, member communications is going to be a place to connect. Uh, patient portals is another place to figure. So I think thinking about social media more broadly, thinking about ways to increase consumer demand for it on the push side rather than on the then, uh, you know, and with organizations that are trustworthy and already embedded and using more natural networks than artificial ones. There's still, you know, there's still, people do pull down, but it's like we can build all these different portals. We, we did that in the early days of the web, right? But if no one goes there, are there any good? And so the strategy shouldn't be to create more social media sites, et cetera, that the strategy does have to be to, to become part of the network in some way. Yes. Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm curious about how your strategies for targeting adolescents overcome the lack of agency that adolescents have in their own lives, and in particular with kind of issues that are important in healthcare, and especially with a vaccine that's going to cost money. So, how do your yeah. strategies kind of overcome that? Um, well, in our medically underserved communities, the vaccines are free for the most part. So, um, so uh, it's it's getting there. And um, my strategy is that you know. Um, Adolescents are able to convince their parents to do a lot of things. You've seen lots of tattoos and piercings and other things yeah, like yeah. that. Um, they're remarkably compelling and persuasive to their parents when they want to be. So uh, I think that, I mean, so my view is that we, we have to treat adolescents as having some agency, even though there might, it might be circumscribed and limited. More importantly, they're future adults. So, um, so I mean, it, for lots of health reasons, I think that, that we just have to possibly consume. Yeah. And in Kentucky, we don't have that exactly, but there's, um, you know, there's, there's, and, uh, and that's where sometimes the provider education is really important as well. Thank you, sir.